Yes. Okay. okay. So, and I, you know what? I probably should be like, welcome to the show. That would probably, I haven't had to do that in the audio. That That's is great. so weird. So like, <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank you for being on. Um, of course you are part of the, the series of women who are at the intersection of like black and indigenous spaces, working in food, um, and living life and like moving through the world in that way. Um, for those of the folks who are watching who don't know, this is Vanessa Parrish, and she, I'm going to allow her to introduce herself. Um, sometimes bios coming from the person that has lived the life always feel a bit more compelling, a bit more authentic. And, you know, I usually get the timeline wrong somewhere. So, um, <laughs> so I will allow you to just go ahead and introduce yourself, give us a little background and, um, yeah, and just kind of talk us through like your journey, your work and like where you are today and then what brought you here. Wow. Okay. Um, so originally I am from North Carolina and I am a transplant to Los Angeles. Um, and such a culture shock, <laughs> like personally and culinary wise, just two different worlds. Um, and so essentially what have I, what, what do I do? So I basically started, <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. Like, like, like what have I done? Uh. <laughs> so, um, I basically started culinary in North Carolina, um, kind of just getting my toes wet as far as figuring out what part of culinary I wanted to be in. I grew up in my grandmother's kitchen, which was all culinary, um, all food, all the time. Um, and I really tapped into that um, with my friends and things of that sort. Like I was the friend in college that would throw fondue and wine parties because I don't know, we're 18, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> We all need more friends like that in college. I don't, I don't um, know what I was thinking. Um, you got people out here eating hot Cheetos and ramen. I was still uh, against yeah. that. I was like, no, I don't eat. I, I didn't grow up eating that stuff. So I was just like, no, I'm just going to eat how I eat at home. You know, so a lot of people in my circle were like, what? What is she doing? Anyway, so uh, I transformed that kind of into like a private catering um, business working for um, a few tech companies that are popular in North Carolina. Um, like I guess at the time it was Time Warner Cable, uh, Siemens, SAS. And then I, when I came to LA, I got into the pastry business, uh, at Bottega Louie. Um, I became their special projects director after a couple of years. Uh, I worked, um, in, uh, management for Susie Cakes. I worked in, uh, with Magnolia Bakery, which I know is a New York staple, um, but I worked in their LA division. Oh, Ooh, they got good banana pudding. I ain't gonna lie. Well, I don't want to talk good, about that banana pudding. Okay. I, just, I know everyone loves that banana pudding, <laughs> but I'm, anyways. Do I want to know what's in it? I mean, is that, is that you know, what we're really doing? It's not like you don't want to know what's in it, but what's in it is also in your pantry. Of course. Yeah. I just have no interest in making it myself. So that's really fair, where, fair. That, so where that happens for me. For yeah. I've made a conscientious choice not to make the banana pudding. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So that is the banana pudding for you. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Okay. So then, um, for a couple of years ago, 2017, I was the host of a show tasting our roots with, uh, Buzzfeed's tasty. And I'm still a tasty correspondent today. Like I'll pop in, in a couple of videos and do some random things. Um, I've done some live show work for BET. Um, my show for Tasting Our Roots is currently on Amazon Prime and Apple TV. Um, so you can still watch okay. it. Which making I thought notes, cool. making notes. Yeah, I thought that was good. <laughs> um, and then I do um, on my private business side. So um, I still have my catering company. Um, and I strive to hire women of color and uh, especially queer women of color because they're extremely underrepresented in professional kitchens. Um, especially when it comes to opportunities, they usually left as prep cooks and line cooks and things like that. Um, yeah. 
So, uh, in, in my kitchen, so I have a couple of clients with, um, with Viacom, with, uh, Google, um, Airbnb, um, and a few, um, people that own Malibu homes that come in the summer <laughs> and I cook for them. And so it's a lot of fun. I just, um, lastly, I, um, have a cookie company called <laughs> Brown Sugars Cookies and we ship cookies nationwide. Um, I just launched my candle line called Sweet Comfort Candles, and those ship internationally. See, that's what I was, yeah. Um, which I'm Ooh. really excited about. Most people, most people don't go global that fast. Okay. Um, I have a lot of. Um, I'm fortunate to have a lot of support in like Canada and the UK and things of nice. that. Sort, so I didn't want to exclude them. I was like, if y'all are ready for the shipping costs, I will ship it. <laughs> I'll do it. Look, yeah. if you're ready to give me the coin, I right. will make that work. Exactly. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, I'm sure there's other things I've missed, but that's just. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like a lot. Of, this is the. It's one of the more dreaded questions. You're like, okay, I just need to get a bio from you, and you're just like, yeah, because it's like it's, you don't want to like play yourself short. Like, oh, I just right. I'm a, like, I'm a stay at home dog mom. And they're like, you liar. Like, you know? Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay. So no, I'm not. I just, and it's that, like, I don't want it to sound like a resume. Right. Right. You know, it needs to be a bit more organic. Like I actually did these things and then, yeah, it, it's, the bios are just it's, tough. Yeah. It's a thin line. It's true. It's true. So my first question is, okay, so getting to, into, and I've been, because Personally, I'm looking at like developing a media brand and like getting into like video production and things like that. So I'm super, my attention has been there and it like A, in the process, B, in like how companies and brands find talent. And mm -hmm. then like, what is it to be in the space? And like, you're not, there's not very many of you in the space. So it's like to think, you know, what is it to think of like how to bring other people along and what is your, what was your... I guess what was your how what, how much were you able to contribute to like the ideas and the execution and like the actual content development working with like Tasty and BET and like all those other spaces? Um, how much of a voice do you get in the in the creation process? That is a supremely excellent question, and I'm gonna say it really depends on who you're working with. So. For example, BET is all about diversity and inclusion, especially when it comes to people of color, well, brown folks, you know, black people. Yeah. So when I told them what I wanted to make for the live streams, things like that, they're like, perfect. Yes, do it. You know, like they're like, all right, whatever. Like, you know, like we trust you, go, you know? Nice. Um, so that was a, a very nice experience, especially even when I worked with like, um, uh, Google the company and, you know, I gave them my menu selections, but that's what they hired me for. They hired me specifically for my menu creations um, and the staffing that they knew I would going to be bringing to the table. Uh, big, some corporations like BuzzFeed have an audience they want to keep. And so they kind of constrict themselves to their audience. So for example, I was the very first long form show on Tasty. Wow. At that time, Tasty was just doing, um, you know, their quick two minute videos, overhead camera type of video. Right. Kind of what got them popular, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't, I think maybe there was one other long form show they were, um, they were um, maybe pitching at the time, but as far as actual production, I was the first long form show. Um, because there was a lack of diversity at Tasty, they had to bring other producers and videographers and directors from different departments of BuzzFeed to come and work with me to, wow. to make it an all black cast. Okay. So okay. it's like, <laughs> okay. Y'all had to curate the black people in the office to come help. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's um, all right. I was the first black hands on Tasty because that was a big conversation. And also, um, there was an extreme amount of backlash um, for my show. And it, I can't express to you how much backlash. <laughs> I that. just, 
Okay. Yeah. So that de- they didn't have the demographic they have four years later. Four years later, they're doing much better. But back then, they just didn't have it. Um, That's in- that is incredible to hear. And it's not surprising, but I think it's in, it's still kind of like you're incredulous when you hear it. You're just, yeah. Are you for real? Like my hands are brown. They're in the top down shot. What? They did not like it. Their demographic was not having it. Um, and who, who are these people is my question. Like, how is it that my hands are that offensive for you? I mean, and they flipped when they found out I was queer. Cause I think we did an episode where we vaguely mentioned an ex of mine and they were like, She's okay, so it's not like we were. I mean, it's not like we were shooting this long form cooking food video for like TBN yeah. or the Seven Hundred Club with Pat right. Robertson, where it's an ultra conservative news station or something. Mm-hmm. They I had to get they had to get someone on staff to like the first two hours the video posted to go through the comments and like delete because they had gotten so overwhelmingly offensive. They had to literally get their like resolutions team specifically on my videos. And I just, you know, I want to remind people, this is only four years ago. It's not like, it seems like a lifetime, but four years ago was like someone started high school and graduated. Um, you know, you finished college. Like it's a short amount of time and it's not like, I mean, we had just stopped having a black president. Right. So freedom was not ringing at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's okay. Okay. So okay. In, in response, <laughs> and basically the, the disappointing part of the story is that in response to that outcry, they fed into it. So um, my show went from talking about the African diaspora, showing different sorts of Black food, because the premise of the show was to be, hey, we're going to go to different places in America um, and showcase Black chefs that are underrepresented. We're going to go to places in America that you don't think Black chefs are, but they are and they're thriving. And we're going to show the few the food they're making. And it turned from that to shrimp and grits, chicken and waffles, gumbo, um, that sort of thing, <laughs> which obviously I, I appreciate that type of food in my culture, but that's not the only food we make. And that was the show we wanted to right. produce. I think people forget like when we, when we only focus on a very specific cuisine in any culture, mm-hmm. what happens is, is we diminish the work people are doing in other spaces Mm -hmm. and it not just for the outside viewer, but for the inside viewer, Mm -hmm. it's like, Oh, it's, it doesn't speak to, it never speaks to choice. It's never like, Oh, I cook this because I want to, that is never the energy you get. What you get is I, I, I can only cook this. It talks, it speaks to like ability Right. And no, efficiency. Yeah. And so when someone goes, why aren't there any fine dining chefs? Why aren't there fine? Why? Why aren't there black people in fine dining spaces? And it's just like, well, the fact that you've kind of relegated everyone to a very specific part, one small part of our cuisine. Mm-hmm. It says to the rest of the world, it says to the industry that they're only capable of producing the one kind of cuisine. It has nothing to do with whether we want to or not. <laughs> I think that is such a profound statement because even, so I was working at Bottega Louis for a good number of years and I'd already gotten the promotion of um, special projects director. They had um, a new uh, executive chef come in, uh, an executive pastry chef come in. Lots of turnover at that place. Anyway, (laughs) but um, he looked at me, he was a French guy, super sweet, but the, old the pre the prior executive chef introduced me to him because i would be working directly okay. under him and he was like you're doing what and i was like i'm the special projects director he goes of a french of a, a french food and i was like yeah i i specialize in french pastry and he goes you specialize in french pastry okay <laughs> i'm not joking and i looked at him and I was like, yeah, I've been here for quite some time. <laughs> and he was like, 
okay, we'll see, you know? And that was just... We'll see? Yeah, and so... We'll he, see what? I just... Yeah. He was not happy. I'm. I, he was not happy that I had a position of power and that I wasn't French, I guess, or, or white or, or a man. <laughs> the possibilities are endless. I'm like, you pick the offense. Like, is it? Mm-hmm. I mean, you tell me which part is the most offensive for you. Mm-hmm. None of these things I can change, but I just at least want to know. I like, wh- Look, as long as you're signing my pictures, I don't care what you think of me. This is me. As long as I'm getting my coins, I don't, I could care less about how you personally feel about any of this. As long as it's not reflected in your behavior towards me or your language or my money. Like, Mm -hmm. as long as we're covered, you can go in the bathroom and be mad about it. You can go in the walk-in and throw something, but don't, (laughs) don't. This is not where we live. And those walk okay. are very tight. You can scream all you want. No you do what you got to do in there. You can yeah. be as racist as you want in there. You can be as misogynistic as you want in there. Like, let the food hear you, but don't come in here with that. <laughs> Girl. Okay. Okay. So, wow. Um, so, to to add a bit more complexity to the matter, when did you start to lean into like th- your indigenous heritage in your, in those workspaces? Like when did you start to find space to vocalize those things and infuse those influences into your food and like into your work? I found the opportunity to use my voice, um, of being, um, I guess racially intersectional when I started working for myself. See y'all see that? See, this is why. This is why we leave places and start our own stuff. So we can live fully as ourselves. Um, There were no, let's hear other voices. Let's experience other flavors. Let's see, you know, like bring what you have to the table. There, there were no conversations like that in the places I was working. It's very, this is our, this is what her brand is. This is what we want to make. And this is what we're going to be making. Even with um I've worked in places that are super creative. Like, you know, we have like I'd spend, you know, weeks curating new designs and menus and stuff for Valentine's Day or Christmas, you know, things like that, new things for them to put in their pastry displays. Um, but they had to be within their niche of specifications. So you can only go so far, you know. Mm. That's a you know what, and that's a great that's that point is excellent. Like it's, I think people should live there for a minute in their thoughts because that idea of building brands that are not expandable in their voice and in their story. So like when I was working, when I was working as a marketer and working, working in marketing and helping people create brands for themselves and things like that, which I still do a little bit here and there is like the first thing we would do is talk about their brand story. And because story is so impactful when you're trying to get product in the world or service in the world, or just get your voice in the world, how you package that and frame it. And what would happen a lot of times is you do kind of see yourself into a corner where your brand can't grow with time. It can't grow with a new audience. It can't grow when content changes or it can't grow when technology changes. And so this is when you find companies becoming obsolete and you like, you know, we see it with like the retail apocalypse right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then brands like Godiva is one of the, the one of the current so casual. Sad. I am sad. I worked for Godiva in 2008 when I was in culinary school, girl. Oh, that's so sad. I love them. I mean, in, but honestly, I learned how to temper chocolate working for mm-hmm. Godiva. I learned, like that was like my first introduction as a kid to like fine chocolate. <laughs> and that, you know, for and like, that, that was a thing that there was a luxury chocolate brand that wasn't, uh, pretty, you know, and I was like, what is this? Ooh, like, you yeah. know? Yeah. And they were, they were one of the first brands that were really successful at, um, uh, what's the word? Like punch cards and mm-hmm. like memberships to like yeah. uh, club stuff. And so you would like, you know, you'd come in, have your membership, you'd get your first like complimentary chocolate yeah, and you could come in every month. Again. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember getting the shipments for that and they're like, okay, top of the month, this is the chocolate we're offering. And look, not for nothing, Godiva chocolate is actually really very good. Mm-hmm. I just, 
you know, in the in the kind of in the landscape of like chocolate, commercial chocolatiers, like, right. you know, Godiva actually does a really beautiful job. And, you know, like I'm not a huge fan of like the commercial, like the retail products. No. Um, because they of course you can't, you know, chocolate in a commercial sense and like a package sense is always gonna mm-hmm. be subpar. But when you came into the store and like we did the the frozen drinks and other things, it was just like Ooh, those chocolates. Because the you know our storage room was um was temper temperature controlled and we did have like a very strict routine and like um mise en place for certain things and so you still had a lot of like culinary like real time culinary like influences wow. in the working space yeah oh yeah girl we would come in and it was like here's your prep list for the day these are the things we need made like they had the chocolate dipped strawberries those chocolate that straw those strawberries got delivered every morning from a purveyor. So it wasn't like there was cho- there were strawberries sitting in a refrigerator somewhere. They came fresh every day, Ooh, and then you had to. I mean, there were now look. No one said they were delicious strawberries, but uh, <laughs> you know they did the job. Like they were big, and that's what people wanted. Yeah, and so, like if you good. if you were in that sweet spot in the spring where strawberries are in season, them bad boys were delicious. But if you were outside of that in October trying to get like strawberries. No. So <laughs> just tart and underripe and white as a sheet in when you get into <laughs> things. But, um, but that's it. We would start the, the machine in order to temper the chocolate. We had a big bowl and you still had to adjust the temperature. Like you, you did, it wasn't automated. Mm. And so you, and that's why I was like, I learned how to temper chocolate there. Like I understood like what the temper needed to look like, you know, like I look not to brag. My tempers were dope. They were okay. super shiny and glossy and they had a beautiful snap <laughs> to them. And, you know, they didn't Love bloom over time. Ugh. Girl. Um, and they, you know, they, they didn't bloom like the, 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 the cocoa butter didn't bloom. The fat didn't bloom over time because a lot of times people would not temper properly. And then over time, mm-hmm. when those strawberries were sitting there, they would just get ashier and ashier mm-hmm. and ashier. And I was just like, see, if you had tempered that properly, you'd be OK right now. <laughs> so, like- yeah. So I learned so much about how to talk to people about food working mm-hmm. for Godiva. Um, and again, like about chocolate. And it was just it's sad to see them go. But like back to that idea about your brand story. The challenge with the Godiva brand story is that it really had a hard time growing with the times. There's really no way to you. I think there's a tremendous amount of innovation that black people bring to food spaces that if people would allow us and trust us enough, you could see innovations in food that we've never seen before. And I think food is one of those things that stays stuck because you don't get enough new talent and enough new voices to come in. Like I am dying to see innovations in Southern cuisine. I'm, 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 I'm looking for the chefs that are like literally creating like collard green foams <laughs> and, and like wild creations like that. Like I want to see the stuff they used to do like El Bouilly in a Southern kitchen. My mom would call that Probably my grandma. My grandma would call it like witchcraft or something. She'd be like, what Look, do, do it then. Let's see it. Let's see the witchcraft and the sorcery. <laughs> Give me some of that. Because like I'm thinking about things like pot liquor and what we could do with that. It's a liquid that's super flavorful and that has been simmering. It's what you get when you like cook soup and wait a day and then reheat it the next day. You're getting that same kind of flavor, mellowing and marrying. And it's just like, what can we be doing with pot liquor that we're not doing right now? Right. What is that? So like to that point about like you taking a position of uh, t- having a role that has influence and power as a project manager and then understanding like, you, the brand had to trust you in order to give you that space. And I, you know, that conversation about trust and then trusting people of color, trusting black people in these spaces. Like, I think that's a component that's always missing because when we talk about equality and we're talking about diversity and inclusion, the, one of the things that it hinges on is relationship and that relationship is built on trust. So if you don't allow us to do the job, you'll never develop trust in us with the job. And so you won't continue to give us the job. Um, So for you to, so now that you are able to kind of live fully in your full identity, 
as queer, as as indigenous and as black, um, what, what does, girl, what does that do for you? Excuse me. What does that do for your work? What does, what does that mean for how you, how people perceive your work, what they taste when they're eating your food um, and when they're engaged with your brand? Because it's one of the things that I love is when someone gets to the final like final product stage of things where Mm -hmm. they're selling their stuff or they're offering a service. I'm always curious as to how much of their personality and who they are is like, has, is the DNA running through what you do? Mm -hmm. Can people know more about you because they're engaged with your work? That is kind of a, a mantra of mine is that I feel like if they can't understand, like even like, you know, like when you go to a restaurant, you can taste when a chef is uninspired when they're lazy girl <laughs> when you can taste it like i'm like yeah. what is this like did they <laughs> have a slap this on my plate and send it off the line like you know what i'm saying like you like you can exactly tell what mood they're in just off of what you're eating yeah you're like did you really send this out did you mean to send this out uh-uh. yeah, like, no, they, send this and, back. <laughs> and so and it's funny because people, you know, people that I eat that I eat with that aren't in the culinary space, they're like, "You got all that on that plate?" And I'm like, "Yes." <laughs> like, you, can... you didn't like ooh, right. okay. <laughs> so did that taste good to you? Then right, <laughs> we need to work on something. So I, I, um, I don't want that to happen with me, you know, mm. because I want people to want to know once they take a bite who who did this. And that you can part. even imagine the kitchen because of how the flavors are prepared. And you know what I'm saying? You can see, like, you can tell, like, when what ethnicities in the kitchen, yes. what even sometimes what gender is in the kitchen, you the can kitchen totally girl. tell based off of certain dishes um, and how they're prepared. And yeah. so I want people to be like, who made this? You know, mm. and I want black women and indigenous women to say one of one of us made this. Yeah. One of, this came from one of ours, which is like it's so interesting to like see black women have a very elevated status right now. And like, let's make no mistakes. We understand that black women are in and out of trend, just like mini skirts and stilettos and everything else. Um, so. The, you know, for us, the trend is like, you know, black women empower black women, but don't make them um, something they're not. It's just it's a lot of complicated branding around black women and not necessarily from us, but right. on our behalf. Right. And the idea that we recognize each other based on products and based on services and like the results that are being put out in the world. Case in point, the woman who was. um I want to say it was the marketing director, the former marketing director for Target. Okay. The black woman. I cannot remember her name. I will t- I'll tag this in the in the interview page because people should know who she is because she's moved on to Essence. I want to say she's the new editor in chief for Essence. I think I know who you're talking about. But I, yeah, I don't yeah. know. She, I was driving from Phoenix, Arizona to Boston because I was doing some work with America's Test Kitchen. Mm-hmm. And I had stopped to like run in to grab like like Tylenol or something out of a Target, a local Target so nearby. And it was in probably one of the like a predominantly, I want to say a predominantly white suburb, like off of like a an exit. It was one of those shopping centers where you have the Target and all the other, you know. <laughs> exactly. Panera bread, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I was just like, okay. So I ran into the Target and I was met. With and you know how Target, you know if you were if you've ever worked in retail, and I am sure most of us have, when you come in in that like front window display, the front door display, so you know about those displays, and they usually change for holidays. And so we had just it was we had just come off of Christmas because I was driving in January, and they were setting up everything for like uh, I was expecting Valentine's Day because right. you know. Thanksgiving is when they start putting the Valentine's Day right. stuff out. <laughs> and <laughs> girl, I was like, why is everything red? It's Valentine. It's it, it's Thanksgiving. I need turkeys. I need brown. I need autumn tones. What is this? So I walked in, and the first thing that hit me was the Black History Month display, mm. which I had never seen in all my years of going to the Target. And it was they were doing like a series of sweatshirts and T-shirts, and they had books. They had the, a full book display of all the books that were written by Black authors or for Black people in the store at the front of the store. So you could not come through the doors 
and miss that display. So I immediately call my sister. I was like, I don't know who is the manager at this Target. <laughs> but you know it's a black lady. Yeah. She was like, how do you know? So I sh- I sent a picture of it and she was like, oh yeah, that's nothing but black. That's a sister right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like it's, because it's so obvious when it's yeah. us. Yeah. And so eventually I'm like doing all the research to discover that the woman who was in charge of like marketing is this black woman. I'm like, I knew it. I knew there was a black woman's signature on this decision. And mm-hmm. it's like, like back to what you do and what you put out in the world. It's like the fact that the the signature is not just personal. The signature is very cultural. It's like black women, very black women and and black femme. They have a very specific signature in the world. It's not, it's not shared with black men. It's not shared with black children. It's, it's, it's literally our own brand of life that shows up in a place. And you can always tell when a, a black woman has arrived into a space because yeah, people are and she's like, ready to work and she's ready yeah. to be apologetic and you know? she's ready to take the risk and she's ready to piss people off, you know, and not okay. and take no prisoners. Say the thing, because it's like, we're prepared to add, and then we're going to give you all the things. We're going to give you color. We're going to give you energy. We're going to give you spirit. We're going to give you flawless. We're going to give you beat faces. We're going to give, we're give you all of this. We're well you not, Girl. And you will go, oh, and then you won't, it won't it won't be cosmetic because you'll have an experience and on the surface everything will be what you think black women embody and so like right. this great hair and these great nails and this beautiful skin and this wonderful melanin and all the things so you'll get that experience on the outset but then the further you go you start to find the wellspring of like wisdom and care and thoughtfulness behind whatever it is. So like I just, re- I ordered, um because now I got to order these cookies from you because you know, <laughs> I'm trying my best to get everybody on the list. So I just ordered from a, a girl who is running a, a chocolate, uh, a, she's a chocolatier out of DC okay. um, named Ashley Pearson. And I, ju- I interviewed her for the podcast last season. She's amazing. And I ordered some chocolates and uh, some um, espresso sables. Oh, from her, them cookies are buttery and delicious, and they have such a nice hit of espresso in them. And so, and she does bonbons. Mm. Talk about tempering for the gods. Like, I the, what her background is in DC because there's a couple of really popular chocolate places in DC, and I wonder if she's worked with them, possibly. like to make and then branched out to make like her own. Because I'd be really interested. Wait, you you become that good when you have honed your skill. Mm-hmm. in other places for sure yeah. with great with other great people that's right. you can always tell and so like her bonbons came in and i got through i bit through that chocolate and i was just like sis <laughs> black woman did this yes ask me how i know um <laughs> but everything that showed up like the packaging was gorgeous uh, everything that was that needed to be branded was branded properly. She had a handwritten note. So of course, it. when I get the box, the first thing I, did, I was like, "Bitch, really? Oh, okay. ma'am, ma'am, can you tell the people how it should be done?" Because we're getting these things in the mail. I'm like, you know, I've been ordering my life away since we've been in quarantine, mm-hmm. and so I keep seeing like things show up to the door, and I'm just like, "So there are no black people working for you, and there's no black women." working for you because this would not look like this the because us we're like we're all about like we layer and package our wisdom and experience and care in in beauty and so i think that's a word that's never really synonymous with black women is actual beauty like they go oh she's beautiful or she's pretty or she's you know she's a bad bitch like they there's a lot of that but we never are in those spaces of beauty like art art, like our art and Mm, like where we show up in girl like, have you seen like a painting of a black woman, things that don't, that they don't, words they don't use to describe it is beautiful. They use, oh girl, this is pro- prolific. And it's, you know, she's being, you know, she's honored in this. And they use a lot of other phrases, Yeah. but the fact that it's a place of like beauty and aesthetics and like no one really goes there. Right. And, and that's a little, that's a whole nother tangent, but <laughs> uh, girl, you look, I was oh, one of these people asking. Italy, real and dangerous. I saw some portraits of black folks in Italy. I was like, you know what? I'm only even gonna we're not even have that conversation <laughs> i just wow so what now okay so now that we're talking about italy like what took you to italy 
oh, I went to Italy because uh, I won a trip. See this, see this, and see, look, she said, I hope I didn't forget no things in my bio. And I'm like, just a small one about winning something and going to another country. I did. I won an all expense paid trip to Italy. Well, I got to pick the country. That's wild. Um, so I, it was basically like, just tell us where you want to go and we'll pay for it. Um, and I got to pick the country and I was like, well, where's a country that I'd want to go? That's expensive because I'm not because you know I'm not paying for this ticket, and, <laughs> and um, I could really get something out of it, especially like um, food wise. You know, I really wanted to experience stuff, and so that was at the time that I was really obsessed with gelatos, and so I was like, okay, well, Italy it is, um, <laughs> and um, that's the obsession. Mm-hmm. It was it was so difficult. We went to where did we go? We went to Pisa, Rome, Firenze. We didn't get a chance to go down the Mafia Coast. We didn't have time. Um, but it was gorgeous, and the food was so thought out. And it goes back to like what you were saying because we didn't. I didn't want to go to any commercial restaurants. I am so anti commercial restaurants when you're traveling. Um, I found like the smallest hole in the wall. Like we just walk and there would be like no one in there. And I'm like, I want to eat here. (laughs) You know, I'm like, show me the neighborhood place that has nobody in it. Yeah. So we stayed in the neighborhood. We stayed at a hotel that was in the neighborhood that wasn't in the tourist area. So we just walked and we were like, they are Italian people. They are sitting down eating here. We will sit down and eat here. Like (laughs) that was, that was what I wanted. And I, I got, what I wanted out of it. I'm telling you, like the, when you get away from the commercial food, cause you know, they, they have these, um, when you go into like the city and stuff, they're like, Oh, American breakfast here and get your pizza and get your fettuccine. And I'm like, they don't eat that stuff. Like, you know, like I don't, I don't want that. I'm mean, going not come all the way from the United States for this. No, not to eat American food. Like, you know, <laughs> like, so, Mm-mm. um, I don't was- eat it when I'm in America. So I don't, okay. <laughs> But that, that's some people want that, I guess. I don't know. But um, yeah, but it was an amazing experience. I got to talk to locals. Um, I went right when Trump got elected. So a lot of them were asking me, like, what's wrong with your country? Um, <laughs> if I could um, give you a list. Yeah, I got that was like the biggest question I got asked was just like, what are y'all doing? Like, that was a huge question people were asking me. <laughs> And I'm like, Look, the fact that we were asking the same questions, we were like, I don't know. What are I, we doing? I can't speak on behalf of the American people. But like, um, I'm like, I don't know what they're doing. That's why I'm over here. But no. Girl. <laughs> oh. I was like, half of my people were enslaved and the other half was kicked off of their own land. I, what do you want me to say? I don't I mean, know. Do you see what I look like? Do you think I have? <laughs> I, was, I was like, I don't know. I don't know I, what they're doing. I have no idea what they're doing. But the food was the food was great. The gelato was fantastic. It was better than I imagined. Um, mm. I even took an excursion. I even purchased this uh, excursion to. We went to the the top of the um, vineyards. They make the Chianti wine, and uh, mm. you can only they only make it in in Florence. And they had a private chef up there doing pizza and gelato demonstrations. Um picking ingredients from the gardens and the farm. Yes, sir. And I was enamored and I didn't want to leave. <laughs> um, but Look. those type of experiences Look. we as people of color are having and we are learning and we want to use those experiences in our food and develop new palettes and develop new profiles and they don't give us so that's why like you know when the guy was like you you make french food and i was like yes because i know about french food but i also know about my food and the the, some of those diasporas aren't that far apart and we can really pull them together to make really amazing food if you think about it (laughs) but you don't give us a chance okay you assume that we're so monolithic in our in our profiles and our creations that we we just we can't learn and expand and do things exactly exactly and it's it's wild because i was watching um 
and this it's it's kind of this is leading into another question. I was watching this special. It was a uh, it's a, I think it's on Hulu, and it's um oh Lord, what's the the Israeli chef? I cannot remember his name right now. Odalangi. Um. Yeah. Anyway, he they did a the Met asked him to put together a team and do a pastry event okay. for th- that represents the uh, the gardens of Versailles. And, you know, look, French, the, the, the French king lived his whole best life with pastry and like he a lot of decadence. And so they kind of leaned into that. And so what he what he wanted was he chose a team of people that had really different styles. They were all pastry chefs in very different ways. Um, and then like what their execution looked like, what, what you know, what materials they used, what um, techniques, all the techniques were very diverse. And so he pulled together this team. So I'm watching him get the team together. He's calling people and emailing people and texting people. And, you know, he's showing up to their places of business and talking to them and blah, blah, blah. And this, this one person had a James Beard award and this person's doing this really cool stuff with his partner and this, all of that. And so I'm looking at his team as it's finally assembled. And I'm like, there ain't no black people on this team. Mm. Where are the, and I was literally out loud in my room, like, where are the black people? Like, I just, so you mean to tell me there was not a single black pastry chef anywhere across the whole wide world? Cause he pulled from the entire mind. world. Yeah. So, and of course, most of the spaces he's pulling from are like either fine dining kitchens or independent pastry chefs who do just really cool. And he had one young lady, she hadn't even worked in any like official food spaces. She was literally working out of like a little warehouse. She it started out as a hobby and then she's doing this thing. And I'm like, so help me understand you're coming to the Met in New York City. You don't have a single black pastry chef. But you I don't one without formal experience that works out of a rare house and she's a contender and i'm just kind of like so you so like help me understand like do you not think we have anything innovative and creative to bring to the table is it because you don't think black people are innovative and creative y'all have hip-hop for the love of god we gave you hip-hop we gave you jazz we gave you beyonce what more do we need to do gave you rock and roll we pretty much gave you all the music you care to listen to right now We've given you the clothes you wear on your backs in this, at, at this point. We have given you Rihanna. We've given you Fenty Beauty, Fenty Savage, Fenty. Fe- all we've given you all of that. We've given you these 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 gifts. And I, I'm like, if anyone's ever, if you watched Black King on um, Black is King on on Disney, we gave you yeah. that. Like these people come from us. I don't understand how you don't think we're creative and innovative enough to be in the in be, to be in food spaces and innovating. Mm-hmm. It's just like and, a conversation we're left out of, and I don't and get it. Even when we are in those conversations, we're making their food. If you notice that a lot yeah. of those prolific black chefs that they've highlighted are making food that looks like their food, that tastes exactly. like their food. So not only can we not look like ourselves, but we can't even cook like ourselves in those spaces. You know what I mean? We have to assimilate ourselves to your specifications or else we don't know how to cook right. like we're not we're not creative because we're only creative unless you deem us to be creative in your in your vision. creative exactly and and the, like the the question part of that for me was in your in your work and this is for me like because it's a it's a, a knowledge uh, a knowledge hole for me mm-hmm. is in when you when you look at the indigenous food ways Mm -hmm. And you look at like the different things that are made and how things are sourced and how things are created from those sources. And it was like, it's like learning about Asian cuisines um, across the entire Asian continent is like when you think about the parts of the meal that that people lean in heavily on. Oh, we have a lot of savory chefs. So we have a lot of so-and-so chefs and, you know, pastry is not a huge thing in this particular culture Mm -hmm. or dessert. And so when you look at certain cultures, you're like, okay, so where does like dessert and pastry fall in those spaces? What do indigenous desserts and indigenous pastry, what does that look like? That's a really great question. Um, For me and my background, it's kind of shaky just growing up because Mm -hmm. um, both sets of my grandparents are indigenous and black um so 
I feel like I kind of come from a mix of multiple uh, tribes. And um, wow, uh, so it's it's kind of it's kind of weird um, because some flavors. It's unfortunate because I've been able to learn about flavors and profiles and desserts from one family member that's completely different from another, but it's all still within the same cultural range. Um, so for me, I would say that I didn't really adapt into indigenous desserts as more as I did flavors. Okay. Um, I liked how things tasted. Mm. Um, I didn't really growing up. I didn't really ask questions like, what is it? (laughs) (laughs) Who did, who did and risk your life? You know, I was just like, what is this? Don't worry yeah. about it. Eat it. Just yeah. eat it. You know, like, especially like in, I, I don't know, like a lot of minority cultures, I assume like, you know, when you got a plate in front of you, that's, there's no questions. There's just, it, yeah, there ain't, there's no, there's no room. There's no, there's no Q and A for your meal. You just go ahead and eat. Yeah. And if you don't want it, then I guess you can sit there until you feel like you're ready to eat it. <laughs> I guess you're not hungry. That was always ours. I'm like, so you must not be hungry then. You're just like, I've been set up. <laughs> yeah, my mom. My mom would let me get out of the table unless I ate it. Yeah, she was. Just She's like, like, "No, you gonna eat these foods because in the hour, if you come back to me and say you're hungry, you you you're in trouble. You're just like, yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I grew up with like you know bread puddings and different cookies, um, lots of those, um, different um sweet fry breads. Uh, <laughs> thinking of a lot of carbs. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, that's true. Fruits and carbs, you know? Okay. Um, so a lot of those types of things. Uh, I'm trying to think. It, it was just good. I just thought, I don't really remember, like, mm-hmm. much about, like, about desserts wise because I, I focus really on savory on that aspect. But it- Oh, I think you muted yourself. Oh no! What'd you <laughs> um, it was about you had just finished saying that you focused on savory stuff. Oh, okay, not too much. I'm not even in my. Anyways, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I kind of focus on savory stuff when it comes to a lot of um my indigenous upbringing, just because that's what was presented. But you know, mm. when we did have treats, um, I really looked forward to them. Um, I did not. I took them for granted more so um as a child than I do now because I really wish that I would have I wish I would have asked what is it I wish I would have asked how do you make this and things like that you know um yeah um because those recipes you know they get lost with 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 the generations um this is true um when people are not making that type of food and it's not getting mass produced and there's not a lot of people eating it you know those those traditions they kind of they waver um so uh, to my detriment, like I'm sure there's a lot more opportunities of recipes that I could have held on to if I were to have been involved sooner. Um, so I'm kind of figuring that out now. You know, I'm having conversations with my grandparents that are still living. I still have a great grandparent that's still living. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to be an active member Um in my community now <laughs> um, to try to preserve. I mean, it's never too late. Yeah. I mean, especially cause like I'm in this, yeah. well, like my ovaries are screaming. So now I'm just like, you know, I want my children to have this culture and you know, like, right. I want, you know, I want my children to learn, but then I realize I don't have anything to teach them because I didn't learn myself. So um, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. much more active in it now. Okay. Okay. Is there, I guess is because you focused more on on taste and flavor profiles and things like mm-hmm. that, is there kind of a, sig- a, a signature flavor profile? And excuse, somebody is in my kitchen burning <laughs> something. Mm-hmm. I hope that was my mm-hmm. kitchen. I was like, girl, no. no. See, no. ours, our little smoke detector is very sensitive. And you, could, you could think about cooking and it'll go off. Um, <laughs> I took mine out because it was going off too often. I'm like, I'm just out here trying to like render some fat out of something and y'all yeah. are in here tripping. No, um, I, now, I, I was, I'm, I wasn't, I wasn't dealing with it. I'm like, I'm going to take the, I'm going to take the risks. I'm going to just chalk it up. And if something yeah. happens, then I think yeah, the apartment's small enough. Fire, I'm standing right in front of it. I know it's on fire. Only one source of open flame in this whole building. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
um, for your uh, and you, just so people know uh, the, mm. the the indigenous tribes that your grandparents and your and your family are from are. Yes. Um, OK, so um, my mother's side, my. Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to just I'm going to just mute. OK, uh, so my mother's side, uh, my grandmother is Cherokee. And my grandfather is Navajo. And then on my father's side, my grandmother is Sioux and my grandfather is Blackfoot. A lot, a lot of different tribes. Um, we just have, they're in here having a disco. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. So is it? It takes a while. Is it someone in your house particularly clicking or just in the building? No, in, in, in the apartment. Cause it's like, we have, they put the, the in what's crazy is the location of the smoke detectors. Is it right? They're literally the like two feet away from each other. I'm like, <laughs> I feel like one is sufficient. So <laughs> specifically because the one in the, in near the door, cause my door is near the main door. is like yeah. they're both next to each other. I don't understand why you, like, need why two- you needed both of these right here. <laughs> girl anyway i mean whenever somebody sounds like somebody's rendering down some onions and some fat which smells delicious but is problematic for a smoke detector that has no sense (laughs) god bless god bless okay so we said cherokee blackfoot say it one more time cherokee blackfoot to navajo Nava, okay. Now in the (laughs) in the cultural conversation around like indigenous history and indigenous Mm -hmm. Um, roots. A lot of, you know, there was always, of course, the whole area. There's Indian in my family for a long time, culturally. And then mm-hmm. everybody realized that it's not a thing. Um, <laughs> and then, to, you know, to go on a journey to figure out if that's a thing, you know, mm-hmm. at this point, because like my grandmother, and I think we've talked, we talked about this briefly, like in our interview with um, Millie uh, magazine, that my grandmother had passed and she had just started to like uncover some of her own roots and she, because mm-hmm. she didn't know. And her mother had passed when she was like, I want to say three years old. Yeah, I don't know. Um, and so she didn't really know much about her. She really didn't even know what she looked like until she was in her like 60s. And they had a picture of her. And so the only kind of the mythology in the family is that her grandmother was Hopi. Mm. Which is interesting because when you read about the tribe, they really didn't leave like the North Rim of Arizona, you know, at that point in history. And so they really maintained their land and their land ownership for, uh, you know, compared to comparatively. And so her thought was that. And then there was a point where. My my dad had flown out to Arizona because I graduated from high school there. He had flown out for graduation. We were in the local mall. And you know how they used to have little sundry shops that sell all the really kitschy Native American stuff. Yeah, so um, they had the little dream catchers and the little uh, uh, turquoise mm-hmm. shark heads and things like that. Yeah. A lot of, like a lot of sterling silver. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they had a little carousel with postcards on it. And there was a Hopi woman on in front of her in front of her home on this postcard. And so we go, we walked past the, the window and my dad caught, I guess it caught his eye because the woman looked exactly like my grandmother. And I do mean identical. I'm almost mad that like, it's been, I mean, I graduated in 1996. It's been that long and I'm still angry. I can't find that postcard. It's not in print anymore. I should have bought it when I had the chance, the whole thing, because he like, my dad's not the guy who like picks stuff up like that and like mm-hmm. points it out. So th- the woman had to look just like him. her. Yeah. So we walked by and then he had, he literally stopped and turned around and was like, is that your grandmother? And I was just like, no, why would she, (laughs) when would she have posed for this picture? And she wouldn't be living on social security if that was her. Like, no. So, but we were sitting there just staring at it. Like Mm. she looks so significantly like my grandmother that I was like, okay, so maybe there's some credence to what my grandmother has said about her own mother. And it was like the thing that was like, you know, the the kind of the splinter in your mind that you can't let go of. Cause it's like, how do you reconcile that? And, you know, you, cause you know, you'll have doppelgangers in the world of, yeah, of, of certain people, yeah. yeah. but you also realize like a lot of times they share some type of cultural history or some type of like connection in their yeah, family. Um, 
when you watch like Finding Your Roots or something like that, I think it was uh, uh, Glenn Close mm. discovered that she is directly related to Princess Diana. And I when you that. think about what, yeah, and it's like when you think about what they both look like, you're like, hmm. oh my God, yeah, that that makes sense because they yeah. do carry, they share some features. Yeah, I can so, go so I was just like, oh, okay. So at this point, like, was there a time where, w- was this information that you always possessed because it was passed down and it had already been like, you had grown up in, on indigenous lands, you had visited these spaces before, mm-hmm. or was it kind of like part of the family mythology that eventually you were able to reconcile with like records and DNA and things like that? Wow. Okay, great. So I'm going to say, what is it? It's a little bit of, I would say a little bit of both. Um, and that's just really because both my parents. So like on my mother's side, they're um, the, the historical that I understand is that um, my great grandmother um, married a black man. Okay. And they were like, no. <laughs> and so she basically left and okay. had my grandmother and her siblings and things like that. Um, so the only culture that got passed down that way was from my great grandmother to her children. Um, on my dad, on my grandfather, my mom's, <laughs> my mom's father, <laughs> Um, they didn't really talk about it much, um, because they are darker skinned. Um, Mm. so, and this is, my grandfather was born in the fifties. So these are times where they didn't really have, and they were, they were born, he was born pretty poor. So they didn't really have time to really focus on, um, passing traditions. They just had to put food on the table. Um, yeah. You know, so my grandfather doesn't really have a lot of memories of traditional things at all. Um, okay. Um, on my dad's side, though, that's where I get most of my, my cultural um, um, information from because my grandfather, um, who he just, just passed a few years ago, um, my grandfather was in, um, had a large family and they're all, they're all indigenous. Okay. Um, so with with that i was able to get a lot of information about um my great grandmother who did live on a reservation and my grandfather um went to the military so he left the res- he was born on a reservation and he oh, left okay. to go on the military so there's a lot of family there that are still on the reservations um mm. and up in the northeast North, okay. I guess it's called Midwest now. The North Midwest, um, like in Detroit area. Okay. Michigan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Michigan, Illinois. Michigan, like Ohio and like yeah, the yeah, those, all those. Yeah, yeah there. Um, so, you know, they're up there. So there's a lot of family that are on the reservations. So um, my dad, funny that you asked that because my dad literally gave me the phone numbers of a few family members that I need to contact because we're trying to get permission to go on the reservation. Um, so oh, okay. I literally got those phone numbers like three days ago. Um, so stay tuned for that. But so yeah, there's a lot. I of- heard it here. Her dad needs her to make these phone calls. I know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really excited um, to to see my family in a whole new way because I've only gotten my information through word of mouth and through cultural expression in the home, not experiencing it firsthand. Um, so that's something I'm really excited to, to partake in. It's because apparently my computer is about to be like, look, this battery, we ain't with it. Go ahead and plug that in. And I was like, okay, apparently it was not charged enough at the outset. I was like, I thought y'all charged for like three hours. It's this disrespectful. Too. We got a Mac, yeah. I mean, it's, I, look. I'm thinking it was at like 98% when we started and it's like, y'all been on here too long. Um, I'm going to shut off. (laughs) And this is like, mind your business. So, okay. (laughs) Um, So to, to kind of like bookend Mm -hmm. uh, the beginning. Cause like I tell people, I'm like, we, these podcasts can't be two hours long. Um, 
the the future of your work, the future of your business. So, okay, we got candles, yes. we got cookies. Are we talking, are we growing like a retail empire situation? Are you kind of just like, you know what, the things that inspire me are the things I'm putting out in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, as you learn more about your ancestry and your history and your roots, what does that look like for your food and like your mm. brand? Um, and so, yeah, so what do you, what are you seeing? I mean, I keep saying post pandemic, but you know what, you know. let's embrace the pandemic as current history. Yeah. Uh, that is where we are. There's people act like it's some type of weird pause in, in time. No, it's part of what's happening. So, well, you know, it, like 2021 is supposed to be like a new year without the pandemic. Yeah, girl, no. <laughs> I think did all the stupid people die. Then it's not. It's no. <laughs> we had a hard time asking them to wear one mask. Now they got to double up. You really think we're getting out of this anytime soon? Well, California Please. just opened up again, even though we are the worst in the country. Did you hear about that? <sighs> I just, there's zero discipline for anything. And so I just don't, oh y'all don't want to keep your seatbelt on on an airplane. You don't want to keep your phone in airplane mode in a flight. Like, I don't expect y'all to do any of the things. But anyway, so in, in like two, three years time, mm-hmm. what, you know, what do, what does your business and your brand look like? This is, I'm really excited to answer this question because um, I was, I was just talking to my therapist about this. Um, I'm a huge advocate. Uh, shout out to therapists. Thank you for your hard work in the last few years. Go Amen. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a huge advocate for mental health. Like fan. That, that could be a whole other podcast. Um, <laughs> so, okay. Um, <laughs> we'll circle back. Don't you worry about it. <laughs> oh, but I was, I was talking, my therapist asked the same question, actually, because I was just telling her all these, I was spitballing all these ideas. And I'm, I want to do them all. So I'm just going to go for it. Um, so, yes, I would like to expand my retail space. Um, I would like to get a contract with um, like Whole Foods, Target, uh, Home Goods, someone that can give me a platform of retail space um, because I want to be able to give people um, products that work. One. <laughs> um, these mass- novel idea, y'all products that work, <laughs> you know, these, you know, these actual, um, branded pans that actually do what they're supposed to do, you know? <laughs> um, and then also like, I'm not really into huge, like processed food things, but if I'm going to do it, then I'm going to give you flavors that you really are excited to try. So I would love to expand mm. my culture. And, um, if I have to do a processed food line, I'd like to extend it there. Um, I'm not going to make another blush sauce <laughs> or, or salsa, you know, <laughs> we have enough of those. We have plenty of those with Giada's face on them. Um, so y'all just move on, just move on. <laughs> so, uh, I want to do that. Um, I'm also really keen into, um, food entertainment. Um, so I'd love to be able to host something. Um, I'm really all about like giving giving others a platform. So if I can get to a space where I can give other people space to do their good job work, then I want it. So if I have you know food okay. and entertainment and I get a chance to have a TV show or a segment or something, then I want to be able to bring other people's ideas and conversations to the table. Um, I love it. And then yeah. Uh, lastly, I have my biggest project, which I'm currently working on. It's going to take me the longest. Um, it is the most exciting project is, um, so I'm currently in the process of attending law school and I don't have a sound machine, but I'm gonna go ahead and insert some like applause sound effects here (laughs) in post-production. Go ahead. So my grand idea, anyways, my, my big idea is that, um, I'm a huge advocate for, um, incarcerated people. Um, I come from a family of incarcerated people. My father is currently incarcerated on um, a sentence of 25 years. Um, mm. so I think, I think we've got nine years to go. We'll see. Um, so with that being said, I have submerged my life in being involved as an incar- a child of an incarcerated, incarcerated person. person, yeah. incarcerated person. Um, so there are, I think they said there are, uh, 6% of lawyers are black women. 
I believe. You can quote me that statistic. I believe can that we, is an accurate statistic. Um, I just, and are we talking like a specific, a no, specialized, no, like no. just overall? Overall. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that is an accurate statistic. Um, so yes, 6% are, are black women. So you imagine that number is even smaller for indigenous women, obviously. Girl. Um, if, there, if it's even a number, if it's even, if it's a, even a thing, a if it's even yeah. a thing, I just, <laughs> um, wow. so what I, what I want to do is I want to see incarcerated people all the way through. So um, mm. I'm going to be um, a defense. The way you do that is becoming a defense attorney. So I want to be a defense attorney. And if I represent you and you get convicted, um, or even if you don't get convicted, but well, for this scenario point, we'll say conviction. Say you get convicted for five years, whatever. Then I will be your lawyer throughout the entire process. So if, okay. you, if you have some sort of unfair treatment, if you have some sort of issue while you're imprisoned, if you want to appeal, yeah. whatever, I'm going to be your person. Then once you are released, a lot of problems is that with with parole and probation, some, some states require you to have a job and a place to stay before they release you, which is ridiculous because how are you supposed to find a job and a place yeah. to stay when you're incarcerated? So then I will be like the person. word we're looking for is uh bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so um what I want to do is I want to start a foundation that um basically we help we well, like I said we start you all the way through. So we're going to find you a place to stay. Um mm-hmm. and then we're also going to employ you. We're going to employ you through my culinary program. So you're going to learn how to work in a professional culinary space. And then I'm going to work with partners that own restaurants, own food trucks, et cetera, and get you employed after you complete the culinary program um, that, that I'm going to be spearheading in that way. And then also as a lawyer, I can work with other lawyers and connect you with people that can help you get your kids back. If you need that, if you need, you know, nice, facility, nice. other things of that sort. So it's going to be a full program of really, getting people rehabilitated and getting their lives back from start to finish. Nice. See, this is ladies and gentlemen, this is what, this is what a plan looks like. Um, <laughs> and it, cause it's, it's a, it's incredible. Like you have a systemic racist justice system. Mm-hmm. And so you build prison, uh, school to prison pipelines from like elementary schools, high schools and things like that. But then there's no pipeline from like prison to restoration. Right. Or, you know, like there's no pipeline there. And so it's like, well, of course you need people to go back because you, if you privatize a prison, it Mm -hmm. only works if you have customers. So Mm -hmm. if you can have return customers, which are the best customers for any private business, (laughs) there you have it. So, you know, to, you know, to help people understand like the idea that someone gets out and stays out, And then to create a society where the attitudes and the behaviors of those who have never been incarcerated kind of are, you build a judgmental space Mm -hmm. automatically in that. Cause it's like, it doesn't matter what the person went for, how long they stayed. If you feel like they served their sentence, if you feel like justice was done, doesn't even, it doesn't even matter at that point, because what they've done is they've managed to make you a throwaway or disposable on account of that. So they take away your voting rights and don't restore them. They make sure that you're unemployable because, you know, uh, job application sets you up for failure. And so those types of things. You can get an apartment because they background girl, check you. Mm-hmm. They background check you. And so it's like, even if the, uh, even if the offense is not related to anything that has anything to do with keeping a place to live. I mean, cause there are people who have never gone to jail, never committed a crime and they are garbage tenants. <laughs> so <laughs> say it, help me understand how that's a qualifier. Um, so yeah, girl. So yeah. So law school, I mean, that was one of my options as a kid. And that's because my mom said I'd like to argue. And so I should have become an attorney. And part of every now and again, depending on the topic we get into, people were like, you should have became an attorney. Maybe you should run for office. I was like, no, I just have a lot of opinions, y'all. Don't you worry <laughs> I about just it. have things to say. <laughs> I just have things to I don't say. Need to and I'm on would, a large scale. I just want to I'm not I'm not the one to get nothing done on that. If you have a vote coming up, I'll vote. If you have something you'd like me to articulate to people, I can do that. But don't ask me to put a plan together. That's not going to happen. <laughs> um, 
So for me, like, like you told you, like you just said, you do all the things. Um, I think we live in a time where do all the things is possible. Yeah. And that you do, you don't have to wear one job title because we're starting to learn that work is not a direct reflection of who we are. Mm. Um, but what we produce is yeah, like, sure. that's just, that's the thing. And so, yeah, I would, I yeah, definitely do all the things. Um, if anyone is listening and they want to, um, participate in these future plans, please connect, make a relationship, talk about it. Because I think there are some, there actually are some really beautiful groups and organizations right now that exist solely to help people who are incarcerated once they're released to get their lives back to Mm -hmm. get to get instantly into a place of restoration and rehabilitation. And so it, it, it's everything from helping them to find places to live, to giving them um, skills to find work, um, work that they love. I think uh, one of my favorites is the homeboy bakery. Is that LA? I think that's LA. Mm -hmm. And they do, I mean, they do everything from tattoo removal to job skills training and things like that. And so like there are some, there are organizations doing this work now. San Francisco is known for the rehabilitation work in the incarcerated system. It's, it's, I just, it's something to really revere. Like obviously they, they have more work to be done, but San Francisco is really taking great strides. Oh yeah. And I was hoping, you know, once you get to that place where it's like, we need to do more, it's like, but you also need to give people more money. Stop playing. You want more work done. You need to cough up some coins, friends. Um, so yeah. So I'm like, again, like, and some of that, you know, I'm sure some of that work you can like, just even get your name in the hat or in the, in the ring at this point and just be like, where, how can I be adjacent to the work being done at this point? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, you know, this, we're here to uh, cheer Vanessa on and her, and her goals of law school um so yeah but i i appreciate you uh thank you for your ambition in the world because it's black women's ambition is what keeps the world moving forward yeah let's be honest um we look at the white house for the love of god uh, <laughs> look yeah. at georgia being blue like if it wasn't oh for, gosh, for black georgia. women being ambitious y'all would be nowhere um so in that same light um for people who want to connect with you and like keep up with your work and your progress um and maybe contribute some of their own time talent and money money yeah. being a keyword um <laughs> we want to buy these cookies and buy these candles like all the things where can we find you what where can we purchase products um and yeah and like where can we just even com- contribute ideas or labor to what you're doing awesome um so uh a direct line to me is my website vanessaparish.com that has my cookies my candles uh what i'm up to uh, my direct links to my social media there's a contact page where you can like you want to reach out to me um, I, that is, goes directly to my email. So there's not like a third party person reading your stuff. Um, so yeah, you can totally reach me there. My social media on all platforms is pinch of brown sugar. Um, double entendre. And y'all, y'all won't forget that. Like, like, please <laughs> just, it'll be on the internets when I put the page up, but like yeah. pinch of brown sugar, it's something you should be able to remember. Yeah, I think so. And then um, more information. I have two other nonprofit foundations that I um, have founded. So there's more information on those on my website as well. All right, ladies and gentlemen, two nonprofits, two. Some of us are out here doing all the work and some of us are doing none. You decide <laughs> which side of the coin you are on. I'm just saying. Uh, anyway, well, thank you for hopping in. Thank you for being like the very first video interview, ladies no, and gentlemen. It's exciting! I'm so excited. It's exciting. I mean, I hope that other people will like watch it and go, "Oh, I can do a, I can do video interview. I feel good about that. I'm gonna put a yeah. little light, get my hair done a little bit, maybe put some, do my face mask and 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 put some lip balm on and get my life together." Um. So yeah, but this season I am so <laughs> I'm so like, well, don't come on here right now. Y- don't come on here with no ashy lips like y'all it's the easiest thing to remedy is some lip lip balm i know you haven't seen it in two years because of the pandemic and if if that's a problem i know you got a jar of coconut oil somewhere stop (laughs) just no ashy lip is not okay in 2021 we have too many resources the technology is there to fix that so fix it um anyway um but yeah i'm excited about this season i just there's so much i want to do and i'm just trying to figure out like how many arms i can grow to get it done and um so yeah but thank you again congratulations i, I mean thank season you four, right it's awesome Girl, you know you you've seen the struggle I, yeah I uh, see the work that you're putting in but i mean you're making 
these are voices, you know, you're, you're, yeah. you know, giving voices a platform for our community and we need it, you know? So we do. I just like, I want, I want kids coming up across the board who want to get into like these particular industries and spaces to know like who's standing up for them right now, who's creating space for them right now. Um, and, you know, like actually have people to emulate. So like now going forward, the, the, the younger folks who are coming up are going to know that it's okay to innovate and it's okay to do your own thing and take your own path. And you don't have to follow like the, t- the traditional trajectory of working in a restaurant. If that's not what you want to do, like you can create your own way. And so I hope, hopefully they're watching and listening to these interviews and learning like, I don't have to do it. I don't have to play by those rules. I can create my own space and like and thrive in it. Dabble and you know work around different spaces. Find out what you want. And find exactly. out what you love because a lot of people think that oh, when you pick somewhere, you got to be there for three to five years. No, you don't. No. No, like have a purpose for getting in, produce something beautiful and then get out if it's time. That is really all that life requires of you. So, ma'am, until until next time. Yes, um, and I'm, I'm adding a someone had suggested like an after the show kind of segment where we can do like Q&A type things. Yeah. So I'm feeling that out like there's, I'm, you know, so you you will probably hear from me about that. So we can so the audience can like listen to the conversation, listen to the episode and oh, then yeah. do, we can do like an after the show. So if they have questions about like things you've talked about and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm working on like that. That's kind of one of the newer. I ideas really love that. Like, I think no yeah. like, podcasts are not doing that. And there's so many times that I'm like screaming at a podcast because I'm like, come on, what's the name? of that and i'm like it's this you know and exactly then- exactly i'm just like we talk back to the, the podcast and we talk back to movies so this is i think we need a space for this for awesome. sure for sure so we will definitely follow up and like once i kick that off then we will definitely have you back in here because i'm okay, sure great. people are going to listen and have plenty of questions so Thank you.